Welcome to another episode of the BGJ Fight Gear Lockdown Talks. Today I'm talking to Shintaro Higashi from New York. He's a judo competitor and a sixth degree black belt. He got gold in the 2007 2011 USA Judo National Championships and was a member of Team USA in 2007 and 2010 at the World Judo Championships. He is also a head instructor of the Kokushi Budo Institute in New York and a brown belt in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. He has a very broad martial arts experience. He also has black belts in Judo, Japanese Jiu Jitsu, Aikido, and Karate, and experience with boxing, wrestling, and uh, the list goes on and on. So if you like these interviews or others on this channel, please subscribe to the channel and leave your comment below, leave a thumbs up, let us know what you think. And uh, you can also follow us on social media, of course, at BGF Fight Gear to see more of all this. But now without further ado, here's Shintaro Higashi. I was thinking of uh, talking a little bit about your background. Um, yeah. You're obviously based in New York and I was really curious, maybe a bit outside of the pandemic, of course, but if you could describe what the martial arts scene in New York is compared to uh, maybe some other cities in the US or other countries that you've seen. Yeah, sure. Uh, first of all, thank you for having me. It, it's a great pleasure. And uh, to answer your question, uh, New York City is kind of a, a main you know, place for a lot of people to go, a lot of transient people, attract some of the best people in the world, and not only just in martial arts, but in art, uh, business, everything. And so, you know, New York City, if you look at BJJ, I know you're a BJJ guy too. Uh, we have the Henzo Gracie School, and we have Marcelo Garcia, and we also have judo schools too, you know, and uh, me being a dojo owner. Uh, the martial arts scene in New York City is very vibrant. And I think it's very, very competitive. And I think we have some of the best grapplers in the world. Yeah. In Manhattan. Yeah. So it's great. It's great being cool. in the city. And how was that for you growing up? Did you, because you come from a martial arts family, was there a lot of, uh, when you were younger, especially already some cross training going on, or were you pretty locked up uh, under your, your father's uh, uh, supervision, I would say? Yeah, you know, I was very much so under my father's supervision for a very long time, right? And he figured, you know, once you're good enough to need external training, then you could go out and do your, your own thing. So right. that was sort of uh, the understanding. And, you know, all throughout my childhood, I did Japanese jujitsu, judo, aikido and karate, mostly judo, right? Because I competed in judo. And then in high school, I branched off to wrestle. So I wrestled in high school and college. And then the older I got, you know, maybe in my late teens, early 20s, I started doing Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and Sambo and boxing and kickboxing, and all these different martial arts. So in the beginning, it was very much so under my father's school. But after that, I started to really, you know, branch out and experience, you know, experiment and try new things. Cool. And, and how was yeah. it for you uh, in general as a kid growing up in a martial arts family or, or at least with a, with a father that was very... Uh, a big icon in, in different martial arts disciplines and had his own dojos. Uh, um, how was that for you growing up uh, to see that as a kid and also to, to have the opportunity on one hand to, uh, to, to have access to all that, but, but probably, I don't know, maybe certain little bit of pressure also. Yeah, for sure. You know, and people assume that I had like this really strict upbringing because my father looks the part of a very tough old school, traditional Japanese judoka. You know, but he was very kind and sweet and, you know, most of the time at home, you know, he was just like the funny dad and he was very, very able to compartmentalize it, him at the dojo versus us at home. Right. So, you know, sometimes it was hard, right, because he's at home, like we're, you know, messing around, joking around, he's stubbing his toe like, ah, and then he gets the dojo, like do your reps. And it's kind of like, hey, babe, we were just eating ice cream and hanging out, you know, <laughs> the hour ago. So it was a little bit tough. But, you know, he never made the training serious up until I was probably a teenager. All throughout my childhood, he just wanted to make it as fun as possible. And I just had to be there. That's it. And being there was good because, you know, there's older guys and people and, and I get to hang out. And he just made it as fun as possible. So I've always associated being at the dojo with having fun. Right. So it just kind of made me want to go, made me want to go. And then eventually I started competing. And, you know, by then I was already in love with it. So. You know, was, it wasn't too strict. Yeah. <laughs> and was there a point where you uh, also like verbalized to him, like, this is something I want to give a serious go, or I really want to make, make a living out, or maybe not a living at that, that mm. you, that age, you're maybe not thinking about it like that, but like, I really want to go for this. Yeah. I, you know, I had a tremendous sense of pride 
doing uh, martial arts growing up, right? Just because my father was who he was and, you know, I would compete at these tournaments and I, I felt really ownership over martial arts because it was something that I did that all the other kids didn't really do, you know? And it wasn't like the messaging of like, you're special because you do this, you're special because you do this, you know? It wasn't really like that, but I, you know, I felt like a lot of the stuff that I was doing in martial arts wasn't something that a lot of the other kids did. You know, and he was always challenging me, always pushing me in a way where it's fun and it was a little bit of give and take, you know, competing like when you're 10 to 12, but you're also competing in the 13 to 16 division, things right. like that, you know, but I was a big kid. So like I was like heavy really early on. So like I would fight in two divisions and fighting up in age wasn't a big deal because I was big, you know, I was fat too. <laughs> I was a chubby kid, <laughs> but like uh, it was good because uh, yeah. And then, you know, I think when I was 12, I fought in the promotional tournament. And I fought like a, a man because I was in the brown belt division already for judo. And, you know, I know it's crazy early to have a judo brown belt at that age. Uh, but, you know, I, yeah. I did. I was a big kid, like I said, you know. So and I think that was the moment I was like, oh, man, like I could. This is something I really want to do. This is something I'm really good at. Yeah. Um, I was my height, 5'8", five, 5'9", five, you know, already 12, 13 years old. And I just stopped growing after I was like 13. <laughs> so I figured I was going to like skyrocket and be really tall and big. Uh, but yeah, I grew, I was a big kid really early on. So, you know, I, I kind of felt like this is going to take off for me. And it kind of did, kind of yeah. did. Is that also why you, because you already mentioned you focused a lot on judo. Why, why did you at some point decide like, okay, I'm going to spend a lot of time on judo or compete in judo? Yeah, just because I wasn't really uh, aware of like the wrestling scene, you know, I was exposed to the judo scene and in the judo scene, there's that hierarchy of like a level tournament, B level tournament, C level tournament, junior championships, you can make a team and the structure of it was very appealing, right? right? If I go to this tournament, and if I win, I could go to this tournament and if I win, I could make this team. So like that sort of gave me these goals. And, you know, I, I believe that I could make some big teams. So I kind of like went with that. Yeah. You know? and, and there's less of that in karate or Aikido uh, yeah. competitions. Yeah. Because it's not a unified organization. Right. Right. Judo. Right. There's one judo. That's it. Yeah. 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 Right. Um, were you always intrinsically motivated or if, were there also times where your father had to say like, come on, you have to keep pushing. You have to keep training. Yeah, he he was pushy too, but in the, all the right ways and not always intrinsically motivated. I think by nature, I'm pretty lazy. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, even when I was in high school, my dad would wake me up at 530 in the morning, drive me to the gym and drop me off. Okay. And then sometimes, you know, I sometimes I would push myself and work out, but sometimes I would just take a nap in the locker room and set an alarm <laughs> and just splash water on my face and go out. You know, that's probably why I'm not an Olympic medalist or anything like that, you know, but. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, I was uh, driven because I loved it. And, uh, you know, I don't think I'm like a gritty, intrinsically super motivated person. I think, you know, I did judo because I love it. And I do a lot of things just because I love it. And uh, when you do something a lot, you get good at it. Good. Yeah. And how does it feel for you today? Because you're, you're 36 now, I believe. And you have yeah. already have a whole life of martial arts behind you. You, probably, you started as a little kid training. Like you, you mentioned you do it because you love it. Does it feel like a job for you or do you feel uh, you never need to work? You're always just doing what you love. Well, so pre-pandemic is different than now, right? Yeah. Pre-pandemic, I had my dojo and it was pumping, you know, 200 students and, you know, I had staff and I love my staff. And, you know, one of my staff is my cousin. So, like, I love hanging out with him, you know, and uh, the kids program is very labor intensive, right? Because of the staff with the parents and the kids and it's a lot more work. But I had a director for that. So I didn't really have to deal with the nitty gritty of like coordinating with parents and makeup classes and birthday party. I didn't have to do any of that. So that was great. That was great. And then the adult classes I would, you know, teach sometimes. And then I had some staff teaching some classes and it was like, I would go in and I would teach my judo to the advanced guys and, you know, teach who I really wanted to teach, right? I could pick and choose, especially when you have a school that size. So that was amazing. I love that, you know, and I still do love it. Now with the restrictions in New York, we could only do one-to-one -one sessions. So I'm doing 99% of my sessions at the dojo. It's just one-to-one. -one. So right. I'm physically teaching the privates one-to-one. -one. And that's nice too. kind of get back to the roots, but I'm not capable of picking and choosing, you know, the type of classes I teach or anything like that. But I still do love martial arts. I still train. You know, there's a couple of people in my dojo who are getting big and getting strong and fast and able, right? So I love training with them and, you know, teaching someone that wants to be taught 
it's a it's a pleasure you know that does not feel like work at all you know what i mean teaching cool. a kid who doesn't really want to be there but their parents want them to be there and they're running around and that that's work you know <laughs> but i think that's the same across the board you know right yeah i got you yeah and, and and um is your um your continuous um interest in martial arts do you you also have a a brown belt or black belt in jiu-jitsu brazilian jiu-jitsu yeah i have a brown belt in BJJ. right is yeah. is that something that um, gives you new energy to follow like new aspects of martial arts in a broader sense like to specialize in certain things and new learn new things yeah uh so my brazilian jiu-jitsu path is not a very traditional jiu-jitsu path <laughs> So it's not like I go to a dojo every day and I train every day with the group class. It's not like that, you know. Uh -huh. I had a student who was a great Brazilian jiu-jitsu athlete and they gave me a belt. And then I went to a jiu-jitsu school for a couple of months and they gave me a belt. And Donaher gave me my purple belt when I went for the summer. Uh, it's kind of like a little bit of dabbling here, a little bit of dabbling there, kind of like yeah. that, you know. And now I teach a guy judo, this guy Brian Glick, he's amazing. He was actually one of first black belts for Donaher, right? So he's a great guy and I teach him judo and he teaches me jujitsu and we have this kind of back and forth. So it's kind of a nice thing. I have a renewed interest in martial arts. You know, I always love doing judo, but judo lately, like I don't have people to challenge me so much in yeah. the New York region. Yeah. I recently went up to Jimmy Pedro's. I, I worked out with Travis. That okay. was a challenge, right? <laughs> yeah. And, and, yeah. And regarding challenge, how was it for you in the beginning where you were uh, like, you already said it was not the traditional path, but when you went to jujitsu classes or, or training a, a bit more according to jujitsu rules, let's say, how was that for you in the beginning? Did you feel like, hey, I can just roll out my judo and and uh, and pick up a few new things, or was it really like a new game for you? How did how you, did you experience that? You know, the first time I've ever went to a BJJ school, like I walked in wearing a judo black belt, right? Because I, I figured it was the same sort of a thing. I didn't really know too much about it. This is like, you know, early 2000s, right? Mm -hmm. So I go in there and wear my judo black belt. Then they did a lot of stand up at the jujitsu school that I happen to walk into. So that was great for me. <laughs> like, yeah. this is exactly the same as judo. And I would throw them and land in side position, uh -huh. you know, in side control. And then I would, I was a big guy too. Right? I'm still like 210, 220 or 100 kilos ish. So it's like I would hold them down and it would feel pretty good. And, uh, But, you know, the instructor was unbelievable. He was a black belt, this guy, Jojo Gorn, and he, like, you know, got me down. And when we were on the ground, boom, he was so good, so fast. His strangles are so good. And I wasn't very good at Nawaza to begin with. And I was like, oh, man, I want to learn this. So then, you know, I walked in the next class with a white belt. And then he goes, no, 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 you can't start as a white belt and give me a blue belt. And I was like, okay, okay. you know. And then I did that for a couple months. And then I moved back to the city because I was home for the holidays, for, home for uh, the summer or something like that from university. Right. Yeah, right. Yeah. So then I took a little bit of a hiatus, you know, and then I, uh, you know, in and out, in and out, you know, I spent, like I said, I spent the summer at Henzo's under Donaher. And that was pretty cool. Yeah. And what's your yeah. stand up game like in Jiu Jitsu? You already said you ended up at a school that, that did a lot of stand up. But if you're yeah. sparring Jiu Jitsu, obviously it's easy for you if you can throw people. But what if people pull guard or they really try to take it to the ground? Uh, And yeah. they are aware of your judo background, so they also don't let yeah. themselves being thrown that easily. I try to not do any judo when I'm at a jiu-jitsu school, you know, and some people want to do judo and they ask for it. Like, oh, man, I want to feel what it's like doing, you know, judo with the guy. And because of my demeanor, people kind of like, oh, yeah, yeah, you know, he's not going to hurt me. And uh, yeah, yeah, sure, sure. You know, it's not like right. uh, I try not to be a combative or uh, aggressive and competitive in any way. It's like, hey, what's going on? Nice to meet you. And then they immediately sort of kind of trust me not to put him on their head, you mm -hmm. know. So I'll spend like the first 10 minutes kind of dancing around and grip fighting, which I like to do. And then I'll take him down, you know, very gently. And then I, I want to stay on the ground. You know, that's usually my first exchange. And we go into Nawaza. Sometimes they pull guard. That's great because I like top position too. And then every now and then, you know, I'll just pull guard because I want to work on bottom position. It really depends yeah. on what I feel like working on that day. You know what I mean? Maybe I watched a YouTube video of someone doing reverse telehiva. I'm like, okay, well, I got to do that. You know, I'm not going to throw them on Sotogari. If that's yeah. the case, right? I'm going to pull guard. I'm going to be in bottom position and hopefully he gets into like the side squat positions. I could kind of work on that. Right. You know, but right now I, you know, most of my training comes with this one guy. So like we go back and forth and I, Hey, can we work on this position? Hey, can we do this? You know, half the time we're just going live. We'll do like 10 minutes on our feet. And then if we go to the ground, we do 10 minutes on the ground. 
and then we'll scramble and we'll go back up their feet. And it's kind of like this flowing thing, which is, which is great. Did you have trouble in the beginning um, uh, to kind of unlearn certain judo things like uh, yeah, where you're thrown definitely. going or knees and yeah. Yeah. You know, unlearn certain things like when someone passes the guard, right. And go into my stomach because yeah. the rule sets of judo allow that. Right. And then if there's no forward progression, all you got to do is stall for five seconds and the, they put you back up to your feet. So there were some habits as a competitor, right? Uh, but I've always done my training in judo to be a full-blown grappler, not just to compete, you know? So even in the dojo, I'm always preaching this to my guides. It's like, yeah, you could do newaza just for competition, right? Yeah. And that's majority turtle position, armbar attack. Person goes to their back, split the leg over under pass and pin. You know, a person passes your guard, tight up, right? All that kind of stuff. But I was like, I don't really advocate that. You know, put yourself in bad position, Pin the person one, two, three, four, five seconds, transition to other positions, look for submissions, isolate an arm, attack a neck, all these different things. So in the beginning, yeah, I, you know, what I had difficulty with is if someone did something like a rubber guard, which is non-existent in judo, I had no clue what to do. Hmm. You know what I mean? So like that was kind of a tricky thing in the beginning. And yeah, it took me a little bit of time to unlearn some things that I picked up in judo. Like we bow, shake hands and go straight to my turtle position. You know, because that's the position you're in most frequently in judo. Yeah. Right. And then sometimes the jiu-jitsu guy's like, what's going on? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Or you even when you're getting. Gift. Yeah. <laughs> and then or someone pins you in side control and you're like, I ah, try to get out, try to get out. Oh, you got me. And then you do tap. The guy's like, well, why are you tapping? Yeah. It's like, I, I'm like, I got pinned. You know? <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Right. So, yeah. And it, because a lot of people uh, that 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 can really see the value of judo for their jiu-jitsu development, even if they don't want to do a certain stand-up uh, grappling yeah. art, but really want to focus on jiu-jitsu. They all pretty agree that, that it's good for everybody in jiu-jitsu to learn judo as well. What, yes. would you, uh, what, would you, what would you advise for just jiu-jitsu people in general on, on how to go about that? Like, is there, Would you say there's a certain level that would be good enough to, to keep you going further? Or would, should they focus on certain techniques or certain principles? What, what would your advice be? Are you asking for jujitsu guys to do judo or for judo right. guys to do jujitsu? Which, uh, which way? Jujitsu guys that also want to learn judo to make their jujitsu better. Mm, that's, that's very good. So I have a couple of different theories about that. You know, going into a dojo and learning Tayatoshi, Harai Goshi, Drop Sayanagi, not going to really help you if you're a jujitsu guy, right? Mm -hmm. So you want to cater your jujitsu style the stuff that you learn from judo that's going to help you in bjj you know so a couple of techniques right off the bat is tomonage right if you go for tomonage great because if you get it you win you throw the person if you miss you're in bottom position right in open guard and there's a lot of transitions that you can do using tomonage tomonage into armbar tomonage into like a choke you could do tomonage into tripod sweep tomonage into delahiva right if you miss tomonage you could even do tomonage yoko tomonage you know, right side versus right side, and then go into reverse delahiva if you miss, right? And then they, you know, squat down really tight, and, you know, that is available for you. So right there, you, you got four or five different sort of transitions to the ground based on one technique. And every time you go for it, you build skill, right? You could say, okay, why didn't this technique work? What was the entry? What was wrong? If you miss, you're in Niwaza anyway, right? right? Person does that to you, you could time ochi kochi leg pick, right? So now all of a sudden you have Fake tomonage, person squats, leg pick. Leg pick, tomonage, right? Fake tomonage, go kouchi, right? And then now you have a back and forth complementary technique, you know, based on not turning your back. And then if you miss, you go to the ground, you were going to go down there anyway. Right. So I would definitely learn sumi, tomonage, kochi, ochi, and leg picks for BJJ guys. That's five moves that you could develop an entire system around. And you could do a lot of these stuff without gripping. Yeah. You know, if you have a Yoko Tomonage both ways, right side and left side, and you could do it from right hand lapel sleeve or left hand lapel and sleeve, then you don't have to learn how to grip, right? Because there is no dominant side. There is no dominant advantage. So you bow, put two hands on, and now immediately you can start attacking. Kochi, Tomonage, fake, Kochi, Ochi, leg pick. So that's, that's a system that I would recommend all BJJ guys to start with. You mm -hmm. know, and if you walk into a judo school and the instructor doesn't do Tomonage, that's going to cause you problems. And if he's teaching you Osoto and Harai, and that doesn't fit into your jujitsu game at all, there's going to be a huge disconnect and it's going to be useless for you. You know, and yeah. it'll be kind of a waste of time if you're trying to compete in BJJ 
and you want to get good on stand up, right? Yeah. I'm sorry about that. My phone's ringing. <laughs> it's okay. Right. So you got to yeah. kind of adjust and, you know, so it would make find sense the right to, to do some research. Yeah. Like you said, to find the right instructor. Definitely. So you can yeah. make a selection of the techniques that will make sense for you to learn. Yep. What's yep. the biggest misconception you think uh, jujitsu people have on, about judo? Ooh, that's a good question. Biggest misconception. Man, that's a. Is, never thought do, about do you that. see certain? Uh, you ever hear certain stereotypes like, "Oh, he's gonna throw me through the mats all the time," or? Yeah, I think so. You know, they're not, they're not think, good on the uh, ground, or. Oh yeah, definitely. Judo guys are not that good on the ground, and some judo guys think they're very, very good on the ground, but they're very good in certain positions, right? If you're in turtle and keeping tight for five seconds, judo guys are good at that. You know, right. they're good at uh, the juji roll because that's a huge part of the system. You know, uh, turning someone in turtle that doesn't want to be turned, mm -hmm. right? But you know, if you could just pull guard, then you know, kind of nullifies a lot of these skill sets. I think, uh, you know, where you are in Europe is a little bit different from the United States. I heard there's a lot more crossover between judo and BJJ in Europe as opposed to the United States, right? I, I'm not assumption. sure. Yeah, yeah, I don't know about the U.S. So. Um, yeah, yeah I, I do know that judo is quite big here. So a lot of people yeah. did train judo when they were little. So maybe they can at least take some of that into the jiu-jitsu game when they start with that later. Yeah. Um, judo, there's not too much judo in the United States. It's a very small judo community. And I would even say, you know, maybe like one eighth the size of the jiu-jitsu community in the United States because BJJ is pretty big, yeah. right? So yeah, it's the you know that makes it kind of like this mystique also because they don't they're not used to seeing judo people. Right, right. right. But you can use so, it to your advantage, maybe uh, also in yeah. in MMA or in jiu-jitsu matches when people don't know yeah. what's coming and suddenly they get thrown in a bit for them on orthodox way. Yeah, that's true. Um, I, what I, another thing I would like to talk about a little bit is like uh, well quote unquote traditional martial arts because you could probably say a lot about that like uh, what's the timeline yeah. in terms of history and what are the roots of it or is it just uh no gi shorts and rash guards versus kimonos mm -hmm. or but yeah. let, let's say the um the more uh mma bjj wrestling type of corner versus uh budo and uh, chinese traditional martial arts Mm. Um, because I think that's a very interesting topic to discuss with you since you have such a, 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 a wide background. You have black belts in uh, Aikido, uh, Japanese Jiu-Jitsu, Judo, and you're yeah. very familiar with Jiu-Jitsu. And well, what we would then say is the more the yeah. modern martial arts, I say. But uh, what's your take on, I don't know if, if we could say Judo is a traditional martial arts because it's also pretty young still. but. Yeah. If you look yeah. at really traditional stuff, what, like what's your take on the, the practicality on that when you mm. put it next to the uh, the modern stuff? You know, you got to, people are not going to like me saying it, but there it, there's limitations on some of the traditional stuff, right? But it doesn't mean that there's no value there. There's tons of value there because that's where it came from, right? Yeah. If you look at sort of the great literary works of, you know, 2000, 1900s, 1800s, but it all comes from Shakespeare, right? Shakespeare's not garbage. Right. Mm -hmm. It still has a very, very important place in this in this world, you know, and that's how I think we should look at traditional martial arts. Right. It's really our roots. Some of the stuff is not practical and some of the stuff now we know because of the Internet and how connected we are and how we can share information, you know, across borders. Right. Like I'm talking to you in Netherlands. <laughs> right. So, you know, it's completely unfair to say like, oh, this stuff wouldn't work in a street fight. Oh, this stuff wouldn't work in a cage. Yeah, you're right. But a lot of this traditional stuff is based on some of the conceptual things and philosophical ideas that can make your life better. Right. And it's not just about fighting and grappling. Therefore, there's that kind of stuff. And there are people in the world, maybe 20, 30 years from now, me and you, we can't bear bolo anymore. And we have back issues and we, we destroyed our knees and shoulders. And the only thing we could do is form. Mm -hmm. Right. And, you know, if we get to that place and we still want to do some sort of combative art, Right. And some sort of exercise and not just go to the gym, and lift weights was nothing wrong with that. Yeah. Then, you know, you could sort of, you know, rediscover the roots of traditional martial arts. Right. And uh, I think it pulls a lot from that community, you know, and Steven Seagal is an example. People look at him and like, ah, oh, you know, he's out of shape or he's old. 
but you know, it's different martial arts. It's a different thing. You know, there's still a place for it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, you know, there's a place for it. And that's, that's sort of my take on that. You right. Know? Right. And do, do you think there should be a bit more transparency? Obviously not everybody's claiming things like that, but if you have something that yeah. is, well, at least partly not, not practical anymore, maybe outside of a, <clears throat> a tr like a 15th century uh, samurai battleground uh, scenario, but on the street mm. here or in a, in a society where there's no war anymore. So they can be more focused on the, the more cultivation of, of your own personality and your character, yeah. character building. Um, but let's say part, part of that martial arts is not super practical anymore. Do you think there should be more transparency from the, from those styles, those teachers about, Hey, this is what this, the emphasis is of this martial arts. And it's not for, I'm yeah. not going to tell you that you can defend yourself with it or go into a MMA cage or something. Yeah, absolutely. There should be transparency, but the problem is some of these people who train their whole lives in a certain style. And they think they're being loyal to that one thing and they haven't had any experience going outside of that they truly yeah. believe that they can defend some of these things you know what i mean we have a japanese jiu-jitsu program and you know there's as part of like the brown belt curriculum there's like sort of knife techniques and i personally me always say hey you know if someone has a knife you know it's odds are stacked against you you know it takes one mistake to get cut you know catching the wrist while a guy is wielding a knife you know most of the time is unrealistic right yeah. Yeah. Some of the stuff is traditional. Yeah, these are techniques, but some of the stuff may work and a lot of it stuff cannot work or may not work depending on the time, you know, and being sort of transparent with that is important. But most people have never been in a knife fight, you know, so right. there's some people who picked up knife techniques at another school that truly believe that they can defend themselves and then they become teachers and they're preaching this, you know, and the, I don't want to say it's not their fault. They should be more educated, but I think little by little with this kind of a world of just information, I think we're getting to that place. Right. Um, yeah. And what it, will that look like? You think if, if you look uh, 20, 30 years in the future, what will be the place and the, the setting of the traditional martial arts? That's very interesting. I think there's a place for traditional martial arts with sort of a modern flair, you know, and now that we have uh, sort of a, you know, place of like ufc and mma which wasn't a real thing even when it started it was like which martial arts is the best striking or grappling or karate or jiu-jitsu like that was the thing right that was the goal of the whole event yeah you know and now it's been around for 20 30 years we kind of know what works right what styles are beneficial what can work in a real setting in a one-to-one -one setting and i think little by little that's going to start filtering into the traditional side like i know karate teachers who've never really sparred before who are now taking up boxing and implementing some of those strategies into their teaching methods. Yeah. So there can be some traditional martial arts with a, a infusion of some of these things, because there's a whole subset of the population who are interested in martial arts that don't want to be a street fighter. They don't like cage fighting, you know, me included, you know, I like the martial arts philosophy. I like, I'm not a street fighter in any sense of the word, you know what I mean? But I like boxing. I like kickboxing. You know, and some of that stuff in a traditional setting can go a long way. So hopefully I see a very, you know, healthy balance between the two. And uh, little by little, you're going to see these traditional martial arts that have no combative training, right? Which is in some martial arts, all cooperative training, right? Me and you were cooperating fully 100%. We're going through and choreographed movements. There has to be a combative thing where our goals are sort of in aligned, right? There has to be a conflict. You're trying to choke me. I'm trying to choke you. I don't want you to choke me. And you don't want me choking you, you know, and that sort of training section has to be a portion of your entire training program. And it's going to start filtering into the, uh, the traditional martial arts curriculum. And I think we're going to have sort of a whole new era and it's already started to happen. You know, I know a guy who runs a, a kid's martial arts program and he was a kickboxer and a Brazilian Jiu Jitsu purple. And he did a little bit of judo. You know, and he's and he did traditional Kempo for years and years and years. So he has like a Kempo system and called it kids martial arts. But those kids are actually learning how to strike, right? Actually learn how to grapple and choke and throw. So I'm like, wow, well, okay. Call it traditional martial arts, not really traditional martial arts, but that could be the new face of traditional martial arts, right? Yeah, it's it's obviously a, a pretty complicated label to put on the when it can go into so many different directions. Do you think it yeah. could also work the other way around uh, where we would see a bit more of the, um, the character building and the focus on, on 
uh, self-development in the mm. MMA jiu-jitsu scene. Yeah, maybe. It's a, a little bit less yeah. hang loose and a bit yeah. more, uh, a bit, yeah. bit more that. Yeah, that would be great too to see that, you know, uh, some I've seen, you know, jujitsu schools where they have their geese on the floor and they're stepping on the gi and the belts on the ground and everyone walking around without a shirt and they're saying crazy <laughs> stuff, you know, maybe they could adopt some of the traditional sort of, I don't want to say values, but the traditional aspects of old martial arts and, you know, the belt is a system is a thing for that, right? They took the belts, right? They borrowed the belts and maybe now they could implement kata, who knows, you know, <laughs> Yeah. right? Right. Yeah, that'll be kind of cool to see. I, I'm very excited on what, you know, the future of martial arts is going to be. Yeah. Especially with COVID. Well, of course, that's, that's, yeah. not, we can't even look a week ahead. It's going to be, <coughs> uh, yeah. 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 Well, how do you see, um, assuming that there will be a, a, well, a life after COVID? How do you see your own uh, martial arts life developing? How do you, how how do you want to look back that an 80 year old Shintaro is looking back at his life? How how can you look back and say, hey, I really did what I'm what I was here for? Yeah. So this apart COVID from all really, the sorry apart from yeah, all the great stuff you already did, like uh, what what we what would you still want to do? Mm, that's an interesting question. Thank you for that question. <laughs> uh, you know, this COVID stuff really you know changed a lot, right? And it gave me time to think. You know, and uh, I've already sort of, I don't want to be a martial arts franchise owner. I don't want to have five schools and, you know, not really teach and just ding around and just completely be a businessman in the martial arts world. I don't want to be, be that, you know, and I think a healthy 100 to 200 students in a dojo is good because I'm in it enough to where I could choose who I really want to work with, but it's not too impersonal. I don't want to be the guy that just dips in once a week and says hi and then goes. I don't want to be that guy too. I want to be involved, right? right. So, yeah, I'm really trying to work my way back, sort of that what we had at the dojo pre-COVID. I have two dojos, right? So I have another dojo downtown, and that was kind of growing. We had about 100 students there pre-COVID, and I definitely want to, you know, build that out. So I want to have a healthy balance between the two. Um, yeah, and it's tough to say. You know, I want to keep doing martial arts, and I want, you know, the opportunity to teach my daughter martial arts, whether she likes it. Or not you know i don't know yet uh i hope she does and that's my goal to you know try to instill a love for self-improvement and training that way she sort of takes it on on her own and it's her own decision to ask me to teach her right and i want a place where i can teach her in a safe way where you know i don't want to put her down the street at some random dojo and you know those kids are getting slammed or the kids are getting kicked in the stomach or they're just kicking and punching in there and they're just dancing around for you know dragon patches and things like that you know, I have my own ideas about what a martial arts school should be. And I kind of want her to go through the system. So I want to build a platform where she could have that, you know, kind of like how I went through with my dad. But my dad's dojo was a little bit different, too. It was a, not too kid friendly back in the day. You know, it was a little bit yeah. more rough around the edges, so to speak. Cool. So I definitely want to build the, the dojo back up to where it's a, you know, my daughter's about to turn three. So I have an ear you know, two years for it to be where it was so I could have a tiny champs program where, you know, I could bring her and, right. you know, I don't want to have to teach her direct because it'll be weird. Right. I mean, I want her to have different teachers and love the program, you know, and love martial arts. And I don't want it to just be me standing and teaching her, you know? Mm -hmm. So I want, I want to build the dojo back up to where it was, but you know, I really don't foresee any of that you know, in the near future, because you know, where we are with <laughs> COVID and politics and the way the world is. For sure. It reminds yeah. me a little bit of uh, Elon Musk, where he, uh, he couldn't find a school to, uh, that he liked for his kids. So he just built his yeah. own. <laughs> yeah. I love it that you compared me to Elon Musk. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, it's like that, right? Like, well, you didn't uh, really compare me, but yeah, you way, I'm great. Yeah. I yeah. Think so too. I'm a big Definitely, fan of this. Yeah. 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 Um, well, I, I really uh, enjoyed our talk and I think people uh, people watching this or listening to this can learn a ton. We mostly have people with a strict jiu-jitsu background, so I'm very happy to have you on with a, a broader background, but also very deep knowledge of specific other disciplines that are related to jiu-jitsu. So nice. uh, that, that yeah, was very helpful. Thank you for having me.